I want to begin by saying that suicide is not a solution. Rather, suicide is a symptom of the shattered spirit, of a person's shattered spirit, and that we are called as Christians and as people to walk alongside with others who may feel like they're all alone. Be a year coming up here this August that the actor Robin Williams took his life. Robin Williams is known for such uh, films as Mrs. Doubtfire, Goodwill Hunting, Aladdin, that Poet Society, movies that made us laugh and cry, or ponder to ourselves, question the world, question authority, question society, to live life to its fullest and to breathe deep in all of those things of the fragrances of life. One phrase that's often quoted from one of his movies called Dead Poet Society is, seize the day and make your life extraordinary. Make your life extraordinary. The extraordinary person of Robin Williams struggled, as we have heard, with depression and anxiety and even the onset of Parkinson's disease. Again, like so many others in the public realm, and even in the nooks and crannies of the private sector, on August 11th of last year, suicide once again took another victim. It's not a simple subject to talk about. I think often people feel ashamed, especially the survivors. They ask those questions, why? Why did this happen? What could have I done? Could have I listened better? Where did I miss the marks of my loved one? It's been said that some 8.6 million adults have suicidal thoughts. It's one of the top 10 leading causes of death. It's the third leading cause of people in the age range of 15 to 24. Now I want you to know that suicide is not just something that's an epidemic for, for young people. We often think of that as an escape from, from life or circumstances, poor grades, I didn't get my allowance. It's not to cheat by their lives, but often young people become the brunt of, of this situation. This symptom. I myself have done services for those who are children, teenagers, young adults, and even senior adults who took their lives. And at every one of those services, I would begin by standing before the grieving congregation, all with this stare on our face, this numbness in our bodies, and say these words Today, we're not supposed to be here today. But by God's grace, we will walk together through this day and the days to come. The faith is often asked that question, well, well, isn't suicide sinful? We know the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Does that mean this person is going off to a, a life of torment and despair? Uh, I think they're trying to run from a life of torment and despair. The Christian perspective on suicide begins with an affirmation from the book of Romans, and we're reminded that in faith, that nothing, that nothing can separate us from the love of God, even suicide. And as a denomination, the United Methodist Church deplores the condemnation of people who complete a suicide attempt. And we consider it unjust the stigma that so often falls on surviving families and loved ones. See, within the Methodist tradition, we also believe that suicide is not a way a human life should come to an end. Often it's a result because of untreated depression or untreated pain and suffering that the church itself has an obligation. It's an obligation to see that all persons have access to needed pastoral and medical care and therapy in those circumstances that might lead a person to feeling of having no self-worth or despair. Suicide is about that search for forgiveness. For a little bit of 
forgiveness that one is unable to accept on behalf of themselves, that it seems as if this is the last option that's available to them, that they finally have something to control in their lives when it seems as if everything else was controlling them. Such loneliness and despair is shared by many. One is not alone. The Bible talks about suicide, and, and often the disciple Judas is the one being uh, kind of the, the poster child of, of the person taking their life. There's two incidences in the Gospels or in the, the New Testament that depict this, this life-taking incident of Judas. The one we read of is out of the Gospel of Matthew. It falls right in line with the, the Eastern narrative, the passion that Jesus is experiencing. He did everything that I think probably most any other disciple did during Jesus' day. That every one of them had done. See, they forgot that he is just one of those various distinguished lists of, of God's faithful who failed as well. People like Moses, Aaron, David, Mary, Thomas, Paul, all committed acts of betrayal against God, but each one found a way back to God's side through grace. In the story of Matthew, we see that Judas is repentant of a choice that he made to betray Jesus. He gives back the 30 coins that he had to, to turn Jesus in. And in the despair there of it all, he, he sees that really he needs to be a blood sacrifice for Jesus. And he takes his own. Perhaps he misses a mark of getting to see that love of Jesus as something that we can't do ourselves, but that Jesus had already done for him. Acts is another depiction of uh, this incident with, with Judas, and in this case, it talks about how he kept the money, how a field was bought, and with that notion is he was really trying to bolster up his social status. We all do that. We get a nice car, a nice watch, some, some nice clothes, and we have this little status symbol here. Judas bought this farmland, and his status was raised up. And the story's a little bit interesting. I've, I've read it in a couple different lenses in the last few days. Often I've looked at it as a more brutal way of the early church wanting to say, we're ticked off at this guy who, who gave Jesus the snuff. And often the story reads like some sort of Harry Carey incident as it talks about his innards falling out of his body. And then I read it again, and it's like, you know, it's almost as like if he had an accident. He basically disconnects himself from being an apostle. He turns his back on that act, and what other way than to give him a shameful death that as he was trying to raise his own status, he trips and falls, and his body gushes out everywhere in a shameful manner. The Bible looks at that word of the gushing out as a sense of, of overwhelmingness. An overwhelmingness that we see in other parts of the Bible, especially in that of the character of the father in the prodigal son, as the son who has been away, who had wished his father dead, comes back, and his dad gushes forth a love for his son who had been away from him. It's the same sort of gushing out of emotions that also the Good Samaritan extends upon the person who's left by the side of the road, who's been beaten up, left for dead, as he picks him up and has compassion. I read this, the incident in Acts with Judah's story, and it's someone who has turned his back on the love, the grace, the forgiving acceptance of Jesus, and he falls into his own dilemma and demise. I still read it as the way the church kind of said we're a little upset with this guy right now. And then in Matthew we have maybe a more real depiction of this individual filled with grief, despair, and loss, and that he tried to make it right but he couldn't continue on his journey.
each of the fields that's uh, depicted in the Matthew text and the Acts is this money purchased a piece of property called the field of blood. A field where life was drained out. Where hope was squashed. Right after Christmas, Dustin and my son decided to, to take a leave of absence from our family and from the house. And he, he went wherever he goes. And I didn't see him for, you know, about a week. Got a call one morning from my older son, Phil, who's been staying with me. He said, Dustin was at the house, but he needed to go to work. I said, fine, have him wait in the backyard. I got home. Dustin was in the backyard, and he was weeping profusely. We sat down at the table as we called each other. I noticed he had the word never carved into his arm. And he began to tell me that I wanted you to find me Pat, in the backyard, never to have to deal with my stuff again. Long story short, so I can get through this, I took him to the hospital so that he could get that care to continue on his journey, the same journey that he continues on even to this day. Many of you ask, uh, how's he doing? And, uh, He's doing what he does, trying to discover himself in the midst of being a parent and allowing him to do his own parenting. He lives where he lives, from one place to the next, sometimes the streets, a moment of time when we get to see each other. You know, it's been said, don't feel totally, personally, irrevocably responsible for everything. That's my job, God. I think of the movie, uh, it's an old time movie called Field of Dreams. It's a baseball movie where the character, Kevin Costner, builds this huge baseball field in this cornfield, and all of these classical baseball figures start to come out in the midst of that. He hears the voice that says, if you just build it, they will come. It's a field of dreams that would be filled with hopes, with desires, Everything to overcome our fears and depictions in life that would overwhelm us. This subject of suicide is that sense that, that leaves us with loss. With that why can't I fix it feeling. That loss of the dream that could have been, should have been, will not be, but we still hope in the living again. good news is that God's grace is always available to all of us. That God's loving presence is that grace, that door that's propped open for us, that's open wide. It's a redeeming power of God's grace that is offered to every one of us. We are not to fear suicidal idolization. That's a fancy phrase for just thinking that you want to hurt yourself. Whether it be in our own lives or in the lives of others. And nor should we jump to conclusions when a friend is having a bad day, if they're feeling depressed or sad, that they're going to go off and hurt themselves. They could just be having a bad day. But it's always okay to ask someone, how are you doing? What do we need to do to just get a little long, further along in this day? And it's always okay to ask, do you feel like hurting yourself or anyone else? Because we ask that out of love, not fear. We ask that out of renewal, reconciliation, and redemption. Not because we have nothing else to do. Or can't feel like we have anything else to offer. Today we come to this table, the table of grace, to claim that life is before us always in Jesus Christ, to be all that we can and will ever be as persons of faith, and I will say even of no faith. I believe that we are defined by who we are, not by what we do or done. 
We are here because we walk into the fields of life and know that we are not alone, but that we are the reality of God's perfect dream. A people who are striving to be whole. I haven't given you any answers today. Only hope. And maybe a window that needs to be broken and opened to allow for the conversations to take place. To express my condolences to you, to those who have felt closeted in this matter, to think that it's a shame, and to remember your loved ones and the life that they still live.